this is uh, about perfection and beyond. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a little bit about the strong perfect graph theorem and sort of tell you roughly uh, what was going on there. And then I'm going to switch to uh, more recent, you know, the strong perfect graph theorem uh, was 10 years ago. So then I'm going to switch to more recent uh, directions of research that, uh, that, at least in my view, have been inspired or came from <clears throat> work and interest in perfect graphs. So let's see. And so different theorems here are joined with different people, and I'll, uh, I'll say who did what. All right, so this is graph theory. Uh, it's about graphs. Graph, graphs have vertices, and then the, some pairs of vertices are adjacent, and then we say this pair is an edge, and some pairs of vertices are non-adjacent, and we'll say this pair is a non-edge. And uh, there are two standard graph parameters that people think about. One is the chromatic number. So what's that? It's when you want to color the vertices in such a way that if two vertices, uh, two vertices are adjacent, then they don't get, don't get the same color. Right? So somehow, if you think of your edges as representing conflicts, then you want to partition your vertex set into a bunch of conflict-free conflict -free sets. All right, well, here's a good way to do it. Give every vertex a different color. Certainly, you're safe. No two vertices are adjacent, but somehow that's, that's not quite what I had in mind. So the real problem is um, uh, colors the vertices so that adjacent vertices get different colors and do it with as few colors as possible. And that's called the chromatic number of the graph and uh, uh, graph theorists and, and computer scientists and optimization people think about, about this number a lot. Um, so here's another, another graph parameter, and that's the click number of a graph. So what's that? A click is, uh, is just a bunch of vertices all pairwise adjacent. And then the click number is the, biggest, is the size of the biggest click you can find. So all right, if you think about it for a minute, there is an obvious uh, uh, true statement here. The chromatic number is always at least the click number, right? because if I have uh, 10 vertices all pairwise adjacent, then I need to give each of them a different color, so the chromatic number is at least 10. Now, when you have an inequality that came you know, basically for free, what you ask is, when does equality hold, right? Uh, there's something nice going on there, but uh, just, just to prove the inequality, that's too simple. So let's try and think about it some more. So when is there equality? When, when is the chromatic number and the, click, and then the click number are the same? When is this obvious lower bound actually the truth? Well, so it turns out the answer is pretty nice, actually. There are many nice natural families of graphs where the click number and the chromatic number are the same. So let me, uh, let me just tell you about a couple of them. So bipartite graphs, you know what that means. You take two sets of vertices, each with no edges inside, and then you put some edges in between. And so then the chromatic number is two, right? Qu color all these vertices red and all those vertices blue, and the click number is also two. Another thing you can do is um, take the complement of a bipartite graph. So that's a little more complicated, and we'll get back to that soon, but let me just tell you what it is. So now, instead of taking two sets with no edges inside them, you take two clicks and then you put some edges between them. So it's a little bit less obvious. Well, actually, it's, it's a theorem of Koenig that uh, those guys also have uh, the click number and the chromatic number are the same. Um, so here's another one, comparability graph. Start with, start with a partially ordered set, set and then uh, make a graph where the vertices are the elements of the set and two vertices are adjacent if they're comparable in your partially ordered set. So again, this is a sort of known theorems in, uh, in mathematics that, uh, that uh, for this graph, the click number and the chromatic number are the same. So, so far, so good, right? This sounds like a good question. We are getting many nice, interesting, interesting families where, where it's true. Unfortunately, you can also cheat. You can take this example, which is my favorite graph on at most 99 vertices, which I'm not telling you what it is. And then I take a click with 100 vertices, and I take disjoint union, meaning there are no edges between them. So what's the story with this graph? Well, the click number is 100, right? There's a click of size 100 sitting here on the right. I can certainly color it with 100 colors, right? So I can color every vertex here with a different color, and I can color every vertex here with a different color, and there are no edges between them. But somehow this didn't really tell me anything about the interesting part of the graph, right? You still don't know what my favorite graph on 99 vertices is. So what that tells you is that uh, this is not quite the right question. It's, it's a question in the right direction when are chi and omega the same. But 
somehow it doesn't exactly capture kind of the interesting part of the world because you can construct examples where the answer is yes and yet the example is maybe not very interesting. So, okay, so we want a better question. We want a question where, you know, the nice answer answers are still there. The nice families of graphs still have the property we're asking for, but, uh, but you, can't, uh, let's, you, you can't cheat. You can't, you can't sort of uh, construct an example which is not actually an interesting one. And so that's, so Claude Berge asked this question in the 1960s. Um, so he started talking about something called perfect graphs. So graph is perfect if the chromatic number and the click number are the same, but I require more, or he requires more. I also want that if I delete some vertices from the graph and I look at what's left, still the click number and the chromatic number are the same. So to say it uh, more, more precisely or in a more standard language, uh, I want that the click number and the chromatic number are the same for all induced subgraphs. So let me tell you what an induced subgraph is. That's the definition in here. So a little graph is an induced subgraph of a big graph. If I can get the little graph from the big graph by deleting some vertices, and then if I deleted the vertex, right, I have to delete the edges that touch it. Uh, they lost an end. But I'm not allowed to delete any other edges. So the only way to get rid of edges is by deleting one of their ends. And there's an example here, so let me start with this guy. Well, this is an induced subgraph of that because to get this from that, all I need to do is delete this vertex. This is not an induced subgraph of that. Well, the easiest way to see it is they have the same number of vertices but different number of edges. So that means whatever changes I made were not by deleting vertices and the edges I had to delete. All right, so again, so for a graph to be perfect, for a graph to be perfect means the click number and the chromatic number are the same for the graph and also for all induced subgraphs. All right, so uh, before, I, before I go to the next slide, so it turned out to be a really good definition. I mean, for a number of reasons. One is that it's, you know the, the nice examples we had before still have the property. You know, the bipartite, bipartite, bipartite graph. If you delete some vertices from it, you get another bipartite graph. So, uh, so the property is preserved. Uh, you know, comparability graph. You delete some vertices from it, you get uh, a comparability graph for a smaller partially ordered set. So again, the property is preserved. On the other hand. The example I didn't like, the example on the bottom, well, if I delete all of these vertices, then you know, I don't know what's going on here. Maybe the click num number and the chromatic number is the same, and maybe they're not. So, so the example I wanted to get rid of, I managed to get rid of. Now, so sort of how do you know you came up with a good definition? Well, if one, one sort of good thing that happens is if it has surprisingly nice properties in areas where kind of you didn't define it that way, right? So, being perfect was defined to do something nice with respect to this notion of color. But then it turned out that actually graphs that are perfect have other interesting properties. For example, there are problems that are anti-complete in general, but you can solve them in polynomial time on perfect graphs. So you can find the size of the biggest click. It's anti-complete for a general graph, but you can do it in polynomial time for perfect graphs. Uh, optimal coloring, anti-complete for general graphs, you can do it you can do it um, in polynomial time for perfect graphs. I'll come back and talk about it some more later. Also, uh, there you know you can sort of you can state the property of being perfect in terms of uh, uh, certain properties of some uh, polytopes, so you know solutions to a certain linear program. And again, it turns out that linear programs behave well, you know, when they come from 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 perfect graphs. So somehow it turned out to be a very good definition. It enco encompasses a lot of different things people, people had been thinking about. So, all right, let me talk about it some more. So you've seen, or we've seen some perfect graphs. Now let's think about some graphs that are not perfect. So here's one. So let's take, uh, so it's called a node cycle. So what you do is you put a node number of vertices on a circle, and now you make consecutive ones adjacent and not consecutive ones not adjacent. So what's the click number? Well, the click number is two. The only adjacent, you know, the only sets of vertices all pairwise adjacent are consecutive pairs. Well, the chromatic number, well, I claim it's not two. Because suppose I could color this with two colors, well, how would I go about it? So I'd have to go one, two, one, two, one, two, and I'm stuck. So the chromatic number is, in fact, three. 
All right, so this uh, cycles on all the cycles on two n plus one vertices are not perfect. In fact, chi is different from other kind. So I'm if you if you're not if you're reading this slide and possibly listening to me, then uh, then you notice that I haven't said everything that's on the transparency. So I have to take a node cycle of length at least five in order for it not to be perfect. Right? Because why? Well, what if I look at a cycle of length three? It's true that I need three colors to color it, but on the other hand, it's not true that the click number is two, right? The click number is three. So, so one cycle of length is five. So let's do another one. This is called the complement of a node cycle. So let me tell you what this is. Again, I put two n plus one vertices in a circle, and now I make consecutive pairs non-adjacent and all other pairs adjacent. Right, so what I did was uh, the, the, the adjacencies are exactly the opposite from what they were in the top picture. Now, what's what's going on with this guy? Well, so what's the what's the click number? Well, I cannot a click cannot contain two consecutive vertices, right? Because consecutive pairs are not adjacent. So if I'm trying to construct a click, the best I can do is go yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, no. So if I had two k plus one vertices, the best click I can find is size k. What about the chromatic number? Well, how many vertices can be colored with the same color? At most two, right? Because uh, the only non-adjacent sets are, are, are consecutive pairs. So if I have two k plus one vertices and I'm trying to color them, and each color can only contain two, well, I need k plus one colors. And in fact, you can do it in k plus one. So only there is uh, k, um, uh, k is k plus one, Again, not perfect. And again, I have to do uh, length at least five because for, for an old anti-cycle of length three, well, it's true uh, that the click number is one, but, all, but the chromatic number is also one. All right, so these were, no, this were so graphs that are imperfect, right? Two infinite families of graphs that are not perfect. And there are two important families of graphs that are not perfect. So let's see why. Um, so when Dersch came up with this notion of perfect graphs, he made two conjectures about them. One was what, was what he called the weak perfect graph conjecture. <clears throat> and what, what it says is that the graph is perfect if and only if its complement is perfect. Now I need to tell you what, co what it means uh, to take complements. Maybe you've already figured it out. So I start with a graph, and its complement is a graph where the adjacencies are precise, precisely reversed. So same vertex set, and two vertices are adjacent in the complement if and only if they're non-adjacent in the graph I started with. Now, if you don't read on if you just think about the first line here, uh, I mean, that's kind of an amazing statement, right? So we define these perfect graphs to be something to do with coloring, and suddenly he says, well, actually, it's complement invariant, right? Coloring is, you know, not at all complement invariant. It's something completely different. So uh, it's kind of an amazing property. Now, if you do read on, then suddenly it all becomes clear. The second conjecture he made is the is what's called the strong perfect graph conjecture. And basically what that, what that says is that the two families of graphs that we saw on the previous slide are the only minimal graphs that are not perfect. So, right, so if, I take a graph, if I take a big graph and I find a little subgraph in it, a little and new subgraph in it that's not perfect, well, then the big graph wasn't perfect either, right? Being perfect means something for all and new subgraphs. So if I take a big graph and it contains one of these or you know, one of these or one of those, well, it's not perfect. What the strong perfect graph conjecture says that this is it. The only way to make a graph that's not perfect is by forcing it to contain a node cycle or the complement of a node cycle as an induced subgraph. Um, all right, so, and just a remark, so obviously the <coughs> second conjecture implies the first conjecture because, you know, in the second conjecture, everything is, uh, obviously complement invariant. The two families I'm forbidding are precisely complements of each other. So if you believe the second conjecture, you should believe the first conjecture. But that's, that's not how the proofs were found. So the first, the first conjecture became a theorem uh, in the early 70s. It's due to Lovas. Uh, and uh, um, so he, uh, and basically what he, he was thinking about it from the point of view of optimization and, uh, and uh, polytopes. And then there's actually a beautiful, so I'm still talking about the, the weak perfect graph conjecture, the weak perfect graph theorem. There's actually a beautiful two-page proof due to Gasparri. It's, uh, you know, you can teach it in a lecture uh, to, to a course of undergraduates. It's kind of 
chicks with matrices, and you don't understand anything at all, but it's absolutely beautiful. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, the hip graph. The strong graph graph theorem took a little bit longer, and uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's a result with Neil Robertson, Paul Seymour, and Robin Thomas. Um, so we put it in 2002, but it's a 150 page paper, so it took a while for it to get refereed and published. So 2006 is the official date. Oh. So, what I want to do now is talk a little bit about uh, uh, some ideas in the proof of a strong graph graph theorem. Um, all right, so what do I need to prove in order to prove the strong graph graph theorem? So I need to prove that a uh, graph is perfect if and only if no induced subgraph is an odd cycle or the complement of an odd cycle. So that means I'll be thinking a lot about graphs of where no induced subgraph is an odd cycle or the complement of, of an odd cycle, so I'll give it a name. And uh, these are called Berge graphs. That's not a name due to Berge, it's a name due to Vashek Kvaka. So then what the perfect graph conjecture tells you is that Berge and perfect is the same. And one direction is clear, right? If something is perfect, then it cannot contain anything with click number and chromatic number difference, so it must be Berge. The difficult direction is the other direction. We need to prove that Berge implies perfect. And so the idea of the proofs sort are of A belief was growing in the field that probably what we need to do is kind of take a step back and forget about the strong perfect graph conjecture for a minute and just think about Berge graphs and just try and understand Berge graphs and prove a theorem that would describe their structure. And then hopefully, you know, if we really understand their structure, then whatever question you have about them, you can answer, right? If you really kind of describe the structure of a certain class, class of graphs completely, and now, now you can, um, uh, you know, deduce conclusions, right? So are they perfect? Well, let's go and check, and so on. So that, that was the idea. It didn't quite work out that way, but, uh, but that's, uh, you know, uh, much of the effort was uh, directed in that direction. So, okay, so what really happened was that so people agreed that well, somebody came up with the idea, and many people came up with the idea that we need to prove a triple of theorems like this. So let me tell you what these theorems, what these theorems are. And uh, the way they're written here, they're not theorems, they're sort of method theorems. There are many triples of statements that, that uh, would, would fall into this pattern. So the first theorem is every Berge graph is either basic or admits a useful decomposition. The second theorem is every basic graph is perfect. The third theorem is a minimal counterexample to a strong graph graph conjecture uh, does not admit a useful decomposition. So I suppose I could prove a triple of theorems like this. Now, why have I, why have I won? Let's just go, go through it quickly. So suppose the strong perfect graph theorem is false. Then there is a Berge graph that's not perfect. And let's look at the smallest one. So, and that's uh, heated with the first theorem. Well, either it's basic or it admits useful decomposition. If it's basic, then by theorem two, it's perfect, contradiction. If it admits a useful decomposition, we get a com uh, contradiction to theorem three, because theorem three says minimal counterexamples to the conjecture don't admit a useful decomposition. Right? So any triple like this that you could prove would get you to where you're going. And in fact, that's what happened. We, uh, so with uh, Neil Robertson, Paul Seymour, and Robin Thomas, we proved a triple of theorems like this. Let me tell you, let me tell you what they were. So what do I need to tell you? I need to tell you, right, basically, I need to fill in contact, content into theorem one. I need to tell you what basic graphs are, and then I need to tell you what useful decompositions are. And then, so you need to be <coughs> that, uh, for my definitions, theorems two and three hold. Or you can go and check. So basic graphs. Well, some of them you've already seen. We have bipartite graphs. We have complements of bipartite graphs. And let me show you the definition of uh, the complement of a graph again, so uh, it has this, right, so the complement of G has the same vertex set as G, and two vertices are adjacent in the complement if and only if they're non-adjacent in G. Now the next one is line graphs of bipartite graphs. So what does that mean? Well, that's basically the intersection graph of edges. So the line graph, and I'm sorry there's a typo here, it should say line graph L of G, not line graph E of G. Uh, so the vertices of L of G at the edges of G, and then two vertices are adjacent if the corresponding two edges share an end. Okay? 
Right? So basically, you build a graph that records which pairs of edges of the original graph meet and which don't. Um, all right, so line, graph, line graphs of bipedal graphs. Now it's getting worse. Complements of line graphs of bipedal graphs. So take a bipedal graph, take its complement. Um, so wrong. Take a bipedal graph, take its line graph, take its complement. Right, that's the fourth class we need. And then the fifth class is something called double split graphs, and let me not tell you what they are because it doesn't really matter. Now at this point, uh, somebody often asks, so this is, you're proving something complement and varied, and yet you have an odd number of basic classes that shouldn't, shouldn't be right. Well, uh, yeah, because for every class, you should also contain its complement. What you're proving is complement and variant. Uh, well, the answer is the, the complement of a double split graph is a double split graph. So right, the last class is its own complement. All right. Question? Okay. So these are the basic classes. So now let me tell you about the decompositions. And again, it's not really crucial what they are. So I'll just uh, I'll just go through it quickly. So the first decomposition is called a skew partition. And what that means is that you can partition your graph into four non-empty parts. You partition the vertex into four non-empty parts: A, B, C, and D. And then everybody in A is adjacent to everybody in B. Nobody in C is adjacent to anybody in D, and the other edges, I don't care. Right? So if I delete A union B, then the graph becomes disconnected, because there are no edges from C to D. If I delete C union D, the graph becomes disconnected in the complement, right? because everybody in A is adjacent to everybody in B. It's the same as saying in the complement, nobody in A is adjacent to anybody in D. Uh, sorry, in B. So, all right, so that's, that's a good thing, right? That's sort of complement invariant, natural in the world of perfect graphs. We like this kind of decomposition. And now, so the, the, the truth is that we don't, but, uh, but for now, we don't know it yet. Uh, so we'll get back to that. And then and the other decomposition is called a two-join, and what that means, again, you can partition the graph into two parts, where sort of the communication between the two parts is, uh, in some sense, impaired. So what does that mean? I can partition my graph and the vertices of the graph into top and bottom. And then in the top, there are two special sets called A1 and B1. And in the bottom, there are two special sets called A2 and B2. Everybody here is adjacent to everybody there. Everybody here is adjacent to everybody there. And there are no more edges from top to bottom. So it doesn't exactly matter what it means, but the point is that uh, I can you know, partition the vertex set into top and bottom, and the communication channels between top and, top and bottom don't work well. You know, two things you can do. All right, so now skew partitions are complement invariant. Two joins are not complement invariant. For a graph to have a two join or for its complement to have a two join, these are two completely different things. So again, I'm proving something as complement invariant, so I will also need complements of two joints. All right, so here's what we proved. All right, this is theorem one. So if you give me a bear graph, then either it's bipartite or complement bipartite or line graph of bipartite or complement of line graph of bipartite or a double split graph. These are my basic classes. Or it admits something called a balanced skew partition. That's a technical detail. Let me skip over it. Balanced skew partition or a two join or the complement of two join. The last outcome was an outcome we, uh, you know, a, another decomposition we originally had, but, but in the end, actually, you don't need it, so you need not, not to uh, dwell on it. All right, so that's, that's, that's theorem one. That's the theorem that tells you something about the structure of every graph. And it's hard, it takes 155 pages to prove it. So, all right, and, and like I said, so there are theorems two and three that go with it. There's a theorem that says all basic <coughs> graphs are perfect, and these are mostly theorems of Koenig, except for double split graphs that we invented because otherwise the proof fell down, and so that we have to prove separately. And then uh, for, for the decompositions, uh, uh, so two joints were known to be, you know, to, 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 to be a useful decomposition. That's a theorem due to Coringers and Cunningham. And then balance skew partitions, <coughs> it's not very hard to, to prove that they're also useful. Anyway, so let me talk a little bit about the proof. So when you're trying to prove a theorem with eight outcomes, the trouble is you don't know which way to push, right? So here you are, you have a graph, and you're trying to prove that this graph has some property, but kind of you don't know if you, what you need to prove is that these two vertices are adjacent, but these two vertices are not adjacent. 
because maybe in outcome one they're adjacent and in outcome two they're not adjacent. So what you need is some way to sort of break your world into different parts where not quite so many options are present in each part, right? And that's basically the idea. So the proof is a sequence of steps where at each step we assume that something is present in the graph and this something directs the behavior of the graph, disallowing some of the outcomes. And on the other hand, we can use it as sort of a, an anchor. We can look at the thing that we assume is present and then see how the rest of the graph attaches to it and then deduce what we need about the behavior. So that's obviously very, very, very high level. Um, so I thought I would show you one step that I can actually you know, at least explain the theory. So, so here's, here's an aspect. Right? So it's a graph on, uh, on uh, eight vertices and uh, disregard the colors of the, of the vertices for now. So a nice property that this graph has is that it does not fall into any of the basic classes. It's not a backlight graph because it has a triangle. It's not the component of a backlight graph because it has a stable set of size three. It's not a line graph because it has what's called a claw. It's a vertex with three pairwise non-adjacent neighbors and it's not difficult to see that those can't occur in line graphs. It's not the complement of a line graph because it has a triangle and a vertex with no neighbor in this triangle, which is the complement of the claw. And you can also check it's not a double split graph. So if I look at a big bash graph and it contains one of those, I know that my big bash graph is not basic. Right? So I've ruled out five out of my eight, my eight outcomes. So I'm doing well. So the next step, so so far it was sort of intelligence. The next step is luck. In fact, it turns out that only one outcome is needed when you contain this. So now don't disregard the colors of the vertices. And then you can see that this little graph admits a skew partition because green is adjacent to red and there are no edges from pink to orange. Right? That's exactly what it means to admit a skew partition. And it turns out that uh, actually this skew partition persists in the whole batch graph. You which of the A1, B1, and so on. So it's not the A1, B1, it's the other one. It's, uh, it's a top one. Oh, it's ABC. Okay. So green is A, red is B, pink is C right. in origin state. Um, so, and turns out you can define rules for the, other, for the remaining verses of the graph as to which set they should go into and prove that the skew partition persists. All right, so that's, that's nice, right? That's, if you contain that, you only have one outcome. I mean, usually uh, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work quite as well, but, uh, but, uh, but this, is, this is the idea. This is how the steps work. All right, so let me just remind you what we were doing. Right? So we were proving theorem one that says every bash graph is either basic or it needs a useful decomposition with the hope that there are companion theorems two and three to go with it that say every bash graph is basic and every, every um, uh, you know, and a useful decomposition cannot occur in a minimal country. So, all right, so like I said, this theorem that I showed you was uh, eight outcomes, that was 150 pages and that was hard. Now, you know, maybe there is something easier you can prove if you allow other decompositions and other, and other basic classes. And the answer is yes, it's true. So in probably about 2010, Paul Seymour and I proved another, another triple of theorems like this. So we changed theorem one, and then we proved uh, theorems two and three to go with it. What we did to theorem one, we added two more decompositions. The first decomposition is something called an even pair. So an even pair in a graph means two vertices so that every induced, induced path between them has an even number of edges. And you can see that the smallest counterexample to Berger's conjecture uh, cannot contain one. And that, that, that was uh, you know, a decomposition that people had thought about a lot. It's just, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't make it to the first cut of the theory. The second decomposition is something we call a dominant pair, and it doesn't really matter, but it's two non-adjacent vertices that dominate the whole graph. Um, so if you, instead of having eight outcomes, you have 10 outcomes, allowing, in addition, these two decompositions, then the proof gets shown. So here it is. Uh, the proof, uh, so I grouped the outcomes differently, so it looks like, like there are seven, but if I did it the old way, there would be 10. Uh, and so now the proof is only 100 pages long. But uh, you might not be so impressed, but uh, so the proof goes in a kind of normal, intuitive way. You, you 
axiom. This is present and you prove something in the axiom. This is present and you prove something. And then there's a really hard bit. Sort of we, you know, it seems to work, but we don't exactly have the intuition for why it works. And what this allowed us to do is cut out that bit that, that, that wasn't intuitive, the bit that we didn't like. So sort of the length of the proof went down by 30%, by but I think the complexity of the proof went down by a lot more. All right, so that's, uh, that's that. <coughs> All right, so, I mean, it would be nice to get, you know, a real simple proof of the strong graphic graph theorem, not uh, kind of one where you go down to 100 pages and you're happy, but uh, that hasn't happened yet. So instead, let me tell you about some other, some other problems about graph graphs. <laughs> so one was to test if a graph is perfect. Right, so... As I said earlier, one nice thing about perfect graphs is that um, there are certain problems that are NP-complete in general, but you can do them in polynomial time in perfect graphs. <laughs> well, if that's, uh, you know, if that's their selling point, then it would be nice if you give me a graph that I could test whether it's perfect or not. And if it's perfect, I'm going to go and apply these clever algorithms. And if it's not perfect, I'm going to say, sorry, there's nothing I can do. And then that was open, right? That was open until after the strong perfect graph can do it. Uh, the strong perfect graph conjecture was proved. But now it's known. So that's a theorem with uh, Gerard Conjols, Lou, Seymour, and Vushkovich. And uh, so what we do is we, to we test this if a graph is bare. Right? We test if a graph contains a node cycle or a component of a node cycle, which now by the strong perfect graph theorem we know is the same as testing whether it's perfect. Uh, and that's the only sort of connection to the strong perfect graph theorem. You would think, you know, something like theorem one which tells you what all Bash graphs are like would help with designing an algorithm to test for Bash graphs. But uh, it didn't. So, all right. Uh, so another thing I should say about, about this, uh, the complexity is n to the ninth, which, uh, you know, is not great. But to our credit, there are two bottlenecks. There are two places in the algorithm where we have a step that takes time n to the ninth. So if somebody's going to improve it, they have to improve it twice. All right. So here's another one. Uh, and now I'm, I seem to contradict what I said, but, but I don't. Uh, so if you give me a perfect graph, find an optimal color. Now, you can do it using techniques from common control optimization, the ellipsoid method, all sorts of complicated stuff. But you know, it's a problem in graph theory. So how about the combinatorial you know, graph theoretical algorithm that says color this vertex, delete that vertex, look at the neighborhood of the other vertex, and find a find a coloring that way. And that's open. That's possibly the biggest open problem left in the, in the field of perfect graphs. Now, so what... How, how is the perfect graph presented? How are you sure that the graph is perfect? Say I tell you. I give you a graph. I give you vertices and edges. I give you vertices and adjacent pairs. And I also tell you it's perfect. So it's like a promise that's perfect. It's yeah. like a promise that it's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, or you can run the, the algorithm to test if it's perfect and stop. I'll also be happy with, the, with, the, with an algorithm that colors a perfect graph and stops if the graph is not perfect. Uh, all right, so, so a possible thing I could try and do is, again, use, use a decomposition theorem, right? So, I mean, there are many algorithms in graph theory that work like this. You want to do something to some class of graphs, so first you learn how to do it on the kind of easy examples in the class. And then you say, well, here the general representative of the graph is built from the, easy, from the easy representatives by somehow gluing them together. And then you extend your coloring along your gluing. And you know, theorem one seems to, seems to be sort of in that direction, right? Uh, the basic classes, we know how to color, and there are some decompositions. But uh, it doesn't work. We don't know how to do it. And the problematic decomposition is that's Q partition decomposition that uh, you know, seemed so nice and natural at the start. If all you had were two joints, <coughs> then you would know how to do it. But because of skew partitions, we're stuck. And in fact, so if I started with a graph that does not admit a skew partition, and again, it says here, balanced skew partition. Let's ignore that. It's a some technical thing. So if I start with a graph that doesn't admit a balanced skew partition, then I can combinatorially color it. That's, that's a recent theorem with uh, Nicolas Trignon, Theophile Trank, and Christina Vushkovic. Uh, so, uh, all right, maybe let me, let me not, talk about, not talk about the proof of that. 
But uh, the skew partition, skew partition is really a problem. It seems that maybe kind of our best hope, if you wanted to follow this route, is to prove theorem one that doesn't use skew partitions, right? Uh, I mean, we could right, think harder and see what to do with skew partitions, but that seems too hard, you know, we tried. Uh, so it seems that really, if uh, an approach like that, if the decomposition kind of approach were going to work, what you should do is go further back, prove a different version of theorem one that doesn't use skew partitions, and then go from there. And Robin Thomas has a conjecture of what that uh, good theorem one might be, but, but we don't know how to do it. All right, so let me, let me switch gears and talk about other things. So perfect graphs have the property that the clique number and the chromatic number are the same. What if I weren't quite so greedy? What if I wanted uh, uh, graphs where the, the chromatic number is bounded in terms of the clique number? Well, that's, that's a reasonable con concept to study, and that's something called chi-boundedness. Chi so let's look at a class of graphs that's closed under taking induced subgraphs. That's just for convenience. And I'm going to say this class is chi-bounded if uh, the chromatic number is at, is at most a function of the clique number. All right? So, OK, maybe it's a trivial property. Maybe it's always true. And the answer is no. Uh, so if I look at the class of all graphs, then it's not true that the, click, the chromatic number is bounded by a function of the clique number. In fact, there are graphs with uh, no triangles, click number two, and, uh, and arbitrarily large chromatic numbers. And there are many constructions. The Michelsky graph is my favorite one, but I think I'm going to skip it because uh, it's not that important. All right, so, so the class of all graphs is not chi-bounded. Then you can ask, well, what classes are chi-bounded? Now, when we were working on perfect graphs, somehow, Induced subgraphs seem this sort of nice and hopeful direction, right? We, from, we forbid a certain family of induced subgraphs, and a beautiful property emerges. So, you know, maybe some other things are, some other nice things are going on with induced subgraphs. Maybe induced subgraphs are like minors, for those of you who know what, what these are. You exclude one, and suddenly, you know, the world becomes clear and simple. Well, uh, that doesn't seem to be the case, at least not, not in this uh, context. Because, so you might, think, you might think that for any fixed graph, if I look at graphs that don't contain it as induced subgraph, then this class is chi-bounded. And the answer is no, because uh, for be a triangle, right? And we already said there, right, not containing a triangle as an induced subgraph is the same as not containing a triangle in any way. And so, uh, and we already said there are triangle-free graphs with arbitrarily large chromatic numbers. So that doesn't work. OK, and in fact, the situation is even worse, because there's a theorem of Verzer that says there are graphs with arbitra arbitrarily large girth and arbitrarily large chromatic number. So girth means the length of the shortest cycle. So for every k and every g, there are graphs with chromatic number at least k and girth at least g. What that tells you is that if I take any graph with a cycle, and I look at graphs that don't contain it as an induced subgraph, I'm not going to get a chi-bounded class. Right? Because there are graphs, right? so I, for, I forbid this graph on 15 vertices, uh, but there are graphs of, uh, of um, girls at least 16 with arbitrarily large chromatic numbers. And they won't contain my graph because my graph contains a cycle. So if you were going to get a graph, you know, to, to get some class which, which is defined by forbidding an induced subgraph that would be chi-bounded, the only chance you have is to forbid a forest. Right? So if forb of h is chi-bounded, then h is a forest. And that's conjecture to be true. That's a conjecture of G.R. Fersh, and it was also independently conjectured by Sumner, that for every forest, if you forbid it as an induced subgraph, then what you get is a chi-bounded class. And that's actually... You know, so, so the strong buffer graph theorem was, like I said, almost 10 years ago. This is now. This is something that people are working hard on now. And you know, uh, well, let me maybe not tell you about what I know about it, but, uh, but because it can be really summarized in five minutes. But, uh, but, but it's something people are very interested in. All right. And so not um, if you just wanted this conjecture 
Well, not very much is known, right? If you just wanted to know for which forest forbidding it uh, gives you a carbon bounded plus, then not very much is known. So Jashrush himself proved it for a path, and then Kirsten and Pen Penrise proved it for uh, uh, trees of small radius, radius at most two, and then Alex Scott has a topological version where instead of excluding one tree, he excludes a fixed tree and all its subdivisions. And then he can prove that the class you get is sky bounded. But recently there have been sort of other approaches to this conjecture that maybe, maybe would, lead some, would lead somewhere, but let me not. Let me not. All right, last thing. So, okay, so Jarfresh says if I forbid a new subgraph, then the class I get is sky bounded. What if I weren't quite so greedy? Right, so what does it mean to be chi bounded? That means either there's a huge clique, or I can partition the vertices into not too many color classes, meaning into not too many independent sets. Well, what if all I wanted was either a huge clique or one huge stable set? Right, that's sort of, in some sense, weaker than GRFish. And that's conjectured to be true for classes of graphs that are defined by forbidding an induced subgraph. That's the Erdeshino conjecture. So what it says is, for every graph H, if I look at graphs that don't contain H as an induced subgraph, then either there's a huge clique or there's a huge independent set. And huge basically means much bigger than, than in the random graph. So huge means polynomial in the number of vertices of the big graph. Right? And in the random graph, what you get is logarithmic in the number of vertices. Uh, so, all right, so this is just sort of more or less a reformulation of that. So let me say, a small graph has their Erdeshinal property. If right, so H has their Erdeshinal property, if there is a, some delta of H, so that every graph that doesn't contain H has a clique or a stable set of size, the number of vertices to the power delta of H. And then the conjecture is every graph has their Erdeshinal property. Right? This is just kind of an easy, you know, an, an, a convenient uh, term to use. Uh, it's not not any new information. So every, the, con the Erdeshinal conjecture says every graph has the Erdeshinal property. Now, we're not doing very well with this conjecture either. Um, it's, only, it's only known for a few graphs. Uh, let me just say, so again, what's th let me sort of s explain the, co the connection with Jarfresh a little bit better. So if I had a class of graphs that's sky bounded by a polynomial function, Right, so if for some H, I could prove that the class of graphs that don't contain H as an induced subgraph is chi bounded by a polynomial function. That would mean that H has the Erdeshinal property. Uh, and there's a calculation here, but let me, let me not show it to you. Uh, now, going back to the Erdeshinal conjecture, well, like I said, not very much is known. So it's known for graphs on most four vertices are known to have the Erdeshinal property. The bull, which is, uh, which is this graph, is known to have the Erdeshinal property. That's a theorem with uh, Muli Safra. And then there's a beautiful trick of Alon Pach and uh, Shoimoshi that allows you to build infinitely many graphs with the Erdeshinal property. So what you do is substitutions. You take two graphs that have the property, and now you substitute one for the vertex of the other. And that gives you another, cl another class with the property. And you can do it over and over and over again. Okay, so the so now uh, you know before their theorem, all cases of Erdeshinal were interested. Now, interesting. Now, only proving er, proving that graphs that are not obtained from smaller graphs by substitution um, have the Erdeshinal property is interesting. But uh, you know we don't know how to do that. And just kind of to show you where we stand. So this is some open cases, right? So for each of these graphs. The forage pass, this is the complement of the forage pass. This is a cycle of length five. We don't know how to prove that they have the Erdeshinal property. So, you know, the world, the world's wide open. And let me just finish with, um, with another twist on the Erdeshinal conjecture, which somehow seems to work better. It's, uh, so I'll say, say what it is more precisely in a minute, but it's something else also proposed by Erdeshinal, by um, Alon Pach and Choi Moshe. And it's equivalent to the Erdeshinal conjecture, but somehow you can get further. You know, you don't get stuck at a five vertex graph. Um, so I don't know what that means, given that it's equivalent, but, uh, but I thought I would tell you. So a tournament is, uh, is a complete graph with directions on edges. Now, the Erdeshinal conjecture says if I forbid an induced subgraph, 
then there's a huge clique or a huge stable set. The, the uh, alone Park Shui Moshe conjecture says, if I, for every little tournament, so for every tournament, if I look at a big tournament that doesn't contain this little tournament, just as a sub-tournament, then the big tournament has something called a transitive sub-tournament, which is very big. And transitive just means you can order the vertices from left to right, and all they just go from left to right, which is the same as saying no directed triangle. Right, so instead of looking for a big clique or a big stable set, I'm looking for, a, for this uh, other creature called transitive sub-tournament. And again, it has the same property that in a random tournament, transitive sub-tournaments have size log the number of vertices, and they conjecture the, with anything excluded, suddenly it becomes polynomial in the number of vertices. Uh, and so there, somehow, like I said, the situation is better. So it's a theorem with Eli Berger and uh, Christoph Karmansky that there is an infinite class of prime tournaments with the erdos property. Right? So again, having the erdos property means the same thing. If I exclude it, that guarantees big, big transitive sub-tournaments. And uh, so the big, and again, the trick of substitutions works, so we're only interested in prime tournaments. The biggest prime graph we know with the erdos property is the bull, has five vertices. For tournaments, for some reason, there are prime tournaments, there are infinitely many prime tournaments with the Erdos-Heinl property. And uh, so, I don't know, maybe this is a better way to think about the Erdos-Heinl conjecture. And let me stop here. Thank you. We are not happy with the current. Is there some way to imagine an alternative So I was just going to say we're not happy with the current theorem one. So uh, hopefully, you know, in the future there will be a theorem with nicer decompositions, possibly at the cost of adding more basic classes. And certainly, comparability graphs are on the list. Not obviously, because uh, right there, like I said, there are two steps which are, which, which are hard. And I remember that there is an algorithm for testing whether a graph is a comparability graph. Sometimes go and think there are more more Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, there, so there are algorithms to test if you're a certain subclass and they're and they're faster. They're faster. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, like if I tell you, here's a perfect graph, and in, in addition, it doesn't contain uh, a cycle of length six. Right. Can you make it faster? And, and, and then I don't know. You could you could turn theorem one into a polynomial time algorithm to get the decomposition. Yes, that that's not the problem with it. Thank you very much.